One of the major challenges related to money in politics is the lack of transparency surrounding political party and election finance. Open and transparent funding of political parties and candidates is desirable because it helps to ensure everyone is playing by the rules. This in turn strengthens the integrity of and trust in politics of the general public and political parties in Africa. Transparency helps to level the playing field, exposes the risk of undue influence over politicians, and helps protect against the infiltration of illicit sources of money, thus contributing to the broader fight against corruption. In recent years, there has been considerable progress in the use of information technology to enhance transparency in financing political parties and election campaigns. The rapid digitalization of government agencies, political parties and citizens alike has significantly expanded the potential to use digital tools to enhance transparency. Use of technology including digital tools such as websites, programs and online resources can help provide solutions towards addressing undeclared, undisclosed and or dirty money in politics. When a country builds an online reporting and disclosure system, it becomes part of a wider societal effort to protect and enhance the integrity of politics. In this eighth webinar series on money in politics in Africa, we interrogate the role of ICT in political finance reporting and disclosure. A very good afternoon and good evening good morning everywhere you're watching us from welcome to uh money in politics webinar three that takes place every month uh the th last thursday of every month uh brought to you by alliance finance monitoring a political finance watchdog in africa today we are going to be interrogating the role of ict in enhancing transparent political finance in africa with me to navigate this theme are three international experts. Let me start with uh, introducing Dr. Magnus Hoffman, who is serving as the Senior Political Finance Advisor at the International Foundation for Electro Systems, that is IFES. Dr. Hoffman has extensive global experience in supporting political finance initiatives in more than 45 countries globally and some of those countries are also in africa some of them that are in africa are, are tunisia we have sudan zimbabwe uh, kenya tanzania among others uh, so he's going to give bring us bring a lot of experience in terms of whatever he has been doing he's also currently serving as the director of the international foundation for electro systems uh, that's a regional europe office he brings in uh, a lot of experiences in terms of the research he has done globally and also in Africa here in terms of in the field of political finance. Dr. Hoffman, you're, you're, you're very welcome and we, we, are, we are happy to have you today. And then also we are going to be joined by Miss Elena, uh, who is, uh, she, she, she works with uh, Zimbabwe, network of elections so she, she has over 20 years of experience working on elect, electro uh, elect, electro governance and democracy in zimbabwe and beyond the borders she has managed electoral projects on various aspects around the electro cycle including political party campaign finances over over the years she has observed and assessed elections in countries such as bangladesh sudan tanzania malawi south africa zambia rwanda uganda namibia ghana among others so she's bringing a lot of experience also in terms of her area of expertise where she has done a lot of work on election observation and also in the area of political financing. Ms. Ellen, you're, you're, you're welcome and we are happy to have you today. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. And lastly, we are going to have an Going to have Mr. Emmanuel Oluka, who is an ICT expert from Uganda. He has done a lot of work in terms of developing uh, uh, platforms that have been used in monitoring uh, campaigns and also 
elections in Uganda. The recently he was one in charge, spearheaded the one that they used on election day. And he has also done a, a lot of work across other countries in terms of helping them develop ICT technologies that are used in terms of election observation. So we know he's going to bring in a lot of expertise in terms of how ICT can be used in, in enhancing transparency in political financing in Africa. He's also currently the executive director of Citizen Watch Uganda, which is in charge of helping uh, organizations in democracy in terms of developing platforms that can be used uh, to monitor elections and other digital platforms. Mr. Emmanuel, Mr. Emmanuel you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Abel, and uh, thank you for hosting me and for inviting me onto the platform. I'm very happy to join the rest of the other colleagues on the panel. Thank you. Sorry, uh, I, I'm saying I will start with Dr. Ohman. Uh, you have researched and written extensively on the subject of political finance across the world. Why is transparency such an important thing in political finance and why do you think Africa should embrace it? Democracy means that we have politicians who want to govern our countries and it is essential for the people in these countries to know how those who want to govern them, in other words, uh, raise and spend their money. Because that is essential for democracy to have a level playing field. But it is also essential for issues like corruption to know is there, am I giving contracts to people who have supported me and that they can use to win further benefits. It's essential for governance if decisions are based on thorough research or if, again, public bids are given to the ones who supported the leaders with money. And it's generally important for the economy. If we have a lack of money, as we do, uh, how we need to make sure that the money of the state are used in the most effective way. So it's essential to have this transparency. And I'd say that uh, political finance, if anywhere on this planet, that issue is import particularly important, it is in the countries in Africa because we are looking at situations with huge amounts of spending, especially in relation to the economy as a whole. Um, we're looking about uh, often very limited transparency. Uh, there's often no information or very little information available about how politicians raise and spend money. Massive issues with uh, the use of state resources and elections, vote buying, etc. So this is an issue that across Africa, even more than anywhere else in the world, needs to be embraced and discussed. Thank you, Dr. Omar. I will now bring you Ms. Ellen Degan. You, you have observed elections across the African continent. And as we speak, you are in Kenya on a long-term observation mission under the auspice of the African Union. Can you bring us up to speed uh, with the situation on the political finance transparency in Zimbabwe, your mother country, but also in other African countries you have observed? Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. Uh, for me, the, the first uh, thing I want to note is that um, when you're looking at political parties' finance, especially in Africa, expenditure, and um, how funds are collected, um the the political parties um funding itself in general you find that the information that is available is quite inadequate there isn't much and even if you when you analyze um the legal frameworks or the policies within political parties or the legal frameworks of of uh, of most of the uh, african countries again there is no adequate information or sound policies around political parties finance so um, in as far as um, the ICTs, uh, ICTs, the adoption of ICTs, information technologies, they can actually play an uh, imperative role in providing efficiency in the political arena in Africa to ensure transparent, open and citizen participation, accountability and effectiveness in the sense that I'll give an example of here where I am in Kenya. 
um, where we have noted that most of the po the political parties that are campaigning um, are using quite an huge resources. Um, and uh, we have a, a, an opposition leader, uh, Honorable Raila Odinga, being supported by an incumbent president. Then we have a deputy president of, uh, of Kenya, um, who is uh, currently in government, also using quite a number of resources. But what is not clear is which resources are they using, the source of the resources that they are using, it's not very clear. But when you now look at um, WhatsApp video, YouTube videos, you know, because of now what social media can do, citizens just record some of these things and they post on this uh, social media platform. You see uh, them coming with helicopters to the rallies. I think at one of the rallies, um, uh, the, the, one of the, the two candidates, I will not mention the names, of course, but one of the two front runners, at one of the rallies, they had seven helicopters. So then you think, okay, uh, seven helicopters, the resources that are required to hire or to have a helicopter at a rally. But then I, after that, realizing that I then tried to interrogate the law, what is provided for in the law in terms of political parties funding, um, what I realized was that uh, in Kenya, they actually um, were trying to put in place a political party's finance amendment, which was not passed by the uh, the last parliament, which has just adjoined for the election, uh, which was the law was supposed now to give a threshold for um, what political parties can use in terms of campaigning for any particular election. So without such kind of policy or a law, it becomes very difficult for um, a, any countries to really um, enforce any mechanisms of ensuring that there's a level playing food in, field in terms of the use of uh, resources in, in political parties campaigning and uh, even political parties financing. Then uh, I will draw back to my country, Zimbabwe. Again, we have the same challenge uh, where we have only political parties that are in power, uh, that are in parliament, sorry. Uh, the ones that can only receive political parties finance. But again, there's no threshold in terms of what they can use. There's also no policies and mechanisms to monitor or safeguard. Then it brings us the issue of what we can do as citizen observers, as, um, as domestic observers, international observers, in terms of monitoring what kind of um, resources are, are at play when it comes to campaigning. And I want to bring in again the need for capacity, the need for, for um, ability uh, by domestic observers, international observers, to actually quantify some of these um, resources that are being used during campaigning and uh, advocate for policies that ensure that there's a level playing field when it comes to campaigning. So we can, um, I can quickly think of things like having uh, things like drones to monitor the numbers or to monitor things like posters, t-shirts being distributed, whatever things that are distributed during political parties rallies, so that at least we can have some quantification of, um, of these resources and come up with numbers, figures, the actual figures of money that is being used in campaigning and see the costs vis-a-vis -vis what our policies are saying and come up with sound policies that can provide a level playing field for emerging parties, small parties, and the parties that are already in power. So I think for for now, uh, I hand over back to you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, I want now to go to Mr. Emmanuel Oluka. In Uganda, you're known as an ICC an expert, expert in elections, elections and uh, you have and done a lot of work in terms of uh, helping develop uh, various uh, technology platforms that have been used in uh, monitoring elections and all sorts of things. And we know that Uganda grapples with the challenge of opaque political finance where nobody knows where the money that finances the election comes from. Comes from. How, How, in your view, in can ICT view, can be can used ICT to be provide used solutions provide solution. for political finance support in this project? Uh, Abel, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Indeed, like you mentioned, I've been around elections probably for close to 15 years in Uganda. And mainly my interest has been to look at the role of technology as far as uh, elections are concerned and what they can actually bring on table. And uh, what is quite interesting and what is imperative from all the last couple of years in terms of experience 
has been the fact that, um, first of all, we need to look at the, the legal framework in the country. Uh, when you look at political finance campaign, the enabling law itself has been quite opaque, just like our sister Ellen is saying, it's, it's probably similar in, in, in similar context. So usually ICT comes into play an enabling role. Uh, I always say that um, technology is only 20% and the 80% is uh, relationships, people, the legal framework and the rest of the things. So technology indeed can go ahead and uh, share sort of data that can enable us to identify um, how much political parties are actually spending on terms of elections. If the data sets are available, the clear resources of that money is available, maybe we could even be able to access some of this information on the, some of the websites for the different political parties. But you'll notice that a lot of this information is actually not available in those spaces. So unfortunately, we are left with the, ident with the, with, with the idea of looking at it from the output side other than the input side, just to quantify how much in terms of expenditure a political party is spending in terms of media, how much are spending in terms of maybe their transport and movement. Of course, in Uganda here, you can't even use uh, helicopters apart from the president who only has that benefit. I don't think there's any other politician who we have ever seen using a, a helicopter for campaigns. Um, of course, we can also look at how much they've um, done a lot of these huge billboards that we see being done during an electoral campaign and a season. So we can only be able to assess that information from what the expenditure looks like, and we try to quantify that in terms of figures, just to give us a sort of projection uh, as to how much um, uh, has been spent in these processes. But indeed, yes, technology is a very critical component in, in terms of enhancing transparency in these processes. But you also need to realize that even in Uganda as a country, uh, much as technology is an enabler, we also have sort of policies sometimes that push back the use of technology itself. When, for instance, you look at things like access to social media, many a time we've seen social media shut down in Uganda during election seasons. We remember there was no internet for almost a whole week uh, uh, during, electron, during the last year's presidential campaign. You remember before that, Facebook was shut down. In fact, up to now, Facebook is actually still shut down. So at the end of the day, much as technology does play a role, we also realize that um, government is still uncomfortable with the role and the, 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 the potential it can actually deliver. I think the other thing which we noticed in the last campaigns is that um, other political parties that didn't have access to um, traditional media like TVs and so forth actually used a lot of technology to share their live feeds about what was happening and it became a huge platform within which they were able to share out their information and sort of with the wider masses, with the youth movements and so forth. So I think even when we try to understand the role of technology, indeed, which is very important, we can also understand the mere fact that it has its own challenges legally, uh, it has political will challenges, but indeed, like, 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 like I would share with the rest of us here, technology is a critical component as far as democracy is concerned, not just in Uganda, I have done elections in Uganda, I've done in Somalia, in Kenya, in Tunisia, Ghana, uh, on election observation with different platforms. And believe me, technology is a critical component of it all, even not beyond just the campaign financing itself. Even with the electoral system, even with election, the EMBs themselves, technology plays a critical role. I know for sure that my sister Ellen is aware about the team of technology experts who are providing the smart a system for the IABC who were arrested and there was a letter from, from the IABC about it. So we all know that the role of technology is very critical as far as democracy and all the other processes of elections are concerned. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll come I'll back to come Dr. Back to Dr. Kofman. Kofman. You have done you have a, done a, a lot of research extensively globally and uh, I want to know I from you as an expert as an in this field of political finance. finance. From where you stand, how can ICT be used to provide solutions for promoting transparency and accountability in financing political parties and election campaigns? Well, thank you, Abel. Um, <clears throat> I'll talk about the advantages of ICT in monitoring campaign finance, bearing in mind that I completely agree with what Emmanuel was just talking about, the, the limitations, and I'll be happy to talk about that first. But 
Starting <clears throat> with the advantages, there are potentially very significant uh, advantages of using ICT in monitoring campaign finance. One is the basic submission of financial information by parties and by candidates. Uh, the requirements are very low. I mean, it's enough to have a smartphone. If you put up the app and you have internet, you can use that to submit information. Compared to you know, a decade ago, I was working with commissions dealing with this in different parts of Africa and Sierra Leone in particular. Um, it is significantly easier to do now. Then we have the issue of reviews of submitted financial data. And that's one that's often lost in this discussion. And I really, really want to emphasize that. The institution in charge of overseeing compliance with the regulations, which in Africa tends to be uh, the election management body, uh, can use data that they receive and cross-check and compare it with other data sources. Um, for example, you can cross-check donation records with tax records. So you can see this person is claimed to have donated this amount, but this person actually only earned that amount last year. That doesn't seem to match. So that will raise a red flag of potential fake donation the donation records. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about the, the, the shortcomings, the difficulties with this, but in, in theory, it is potentially very useful. And also then the third aspect of this, which is the publication of data. Uh, most African uh, election commissions and other bodies dealing with this do publish some information on the website, but it tends to be scanned PDFs of hard copy reports, often handwritten reports, it's almost impossible to read them in many cases. It is impossible to uh, scrape the data and get the data into a computer system uh, by electronic means. It has to be done by hand. And if you have an electronic publication, if you have a database, what I would like to do as a minimum is to go in and see, has Ellen or anyone else made a donation to any political party or any candidate in any election. If I can't do that, uh, then the system is not good enough. It's actually not difficult to do, assuming, and I agree with Emmanuel again, that we have the right data available. And then there are so many different aspects of this. It can provide parallel tracks of information. So oversight bodies can have not only the information from parties, but also from banks, also from uh, TV stations, etc., etc. This can also then be made available to the people. Uh, where it works well, we now have real-time uh, publication of donation records. So if you make a donation to a political party, that information goes uh, becomes public immediately because the donation is made in the banking system does require that the donation is actually made through the banking system. We'll talk more about that. It can also help to identify things like abuse of state resources. We can track government budgets and see are they spending more or budgeting more in relation to an election campaign? Are they spending more money on in certain areas that we know are relevant? Uh, services to citizens, health, infrastructure, and education tends to be the key areas. And it can be incredibly important for journalists and election observers to allow them to follow the money. So there is huge potential in ICT uh, in bringing transparency in election and campaign finance. And then there are some difficulties as well, but I'll get to that in a second. Thank you, Dr. Oman. Uh, I will go back to Ms. Ellen Digane. I know you are you are right now in Kenya, and uh, I want to bring us up to speed on how IEBC, that's the National Election Management Board, is handling so far the issue of campaign finance a disclosure. Uh, are there any other lessons maybe we can learn from what Kenya is doing uh, for to un that can be shared among other African countries, or it's just a basket case, nothing is being done? Can you be able to share with us what's happening? Okay, thank you very much. From from what I know, um, uh, I, I think I'll check again, but from what I know at the moment, I don't think there is much that they are doing. Like I indicated, um, there is no uh, law that uh, 
compels political parties to use a certain amount of money. And also there is, um, of course, the issue of use of public resources, abuse of public resources, what some say misuse of public resources. I think it's general, it's everywhere, that uh, it should be uh, not so. Uh, public resources should not be used to benefit one political party uh, in any context. But uh, like I indicated earlier, the complexities around this election where you have a incumbent president supporting opposition and then a, a deputy pre, uh, president also running uh, as a presidential candidate. So the complexities around the election makes it prone to abuse of state resources by both front runners. But I don't have evidence that that is what is happening. But I just gave an example of um, how also ICTs helped us as observers to see that uh, there's a potential abuse of state resources by virtue of having a candidate coming to a rally with seven helicopters, an entourage of seven helicopters. So we don't know where the resources are from, whether that was funded by a, a, a private person or from party finances. The information is not there, but I was just trying to link the, the, the way social media is also at play in terms of helping, helping us as uh, political analysts to see some of the things that we may not see when we are uh, observing elections. Uh, in the case that rally was outside Nairobi and I'm in Nairobi, so there's no way I would have known about that. It did not been for the social media platform. So that's how I was bringing in now the ICTs in that angle. Then I want to agree to what, what um, 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 Magnus has uh, alluded to. Uh, you asked also a question that if we ever funded political parties ourselves, I don't know whether you're asking me as an individual or, <laughs> or my organization. As an individual, no. Um, and as an organization, no as well. We have never done that as an organization. But I want to bring uh, to the discussion an example of um, that happened in my country. I think it was some time, I think three or so months ago, um, yeah, just before our, our, our by-election that we held in March, where uh, there was a lot of violence targeted at uh, the main opposition leader. I think those who follow Zimbabwe politics, uh, the opposition leader is Nelson Chamisa. So there was a lot of violence uh, targeted at this party. And um, citizens, Zimbabweans and others in the diaspora managed to crowdsource through the use of a social media handle to raise funds for purchasing a, a, a vehicle which is bulletproof for, for the party leader. So they tried to mobilize resources to purchase a vehicle that is bulletproof. Um, so following the discussion at some point, there were issues around uh, that when the money was raised, I think about 250,000 US dollars at some point, then there were issues of accountability that were raised by some of the members. So they were having this Twitter space discussing and some of the Twitter spaces, they were arguing about the, the um, absence of transparency in terms of how the money was being handled within the, the party. So issues of also intra-party transparency and these people who were donating probably they were not even party supporters maybe other external people then i also want to 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 discuss the issue of um openness i think uh, magnus in a normal democracy in uh, maybe in in western countries it's very very uh possible uh what you were saying that you have um uh, uh information from the banks uh, information about who is donating to who, but in our context, in particular my country, Zimbabwe, that is not possible. That information, you can never find uh, that information. The banks, they don't disclose that. There's no disclosure of some of those things that you're talking about that are possible in other countries. And even now, journalists just to be allowed to follow, um, uh, even to get some of the information, general information, not even about money, about anything, it's not easy. My first profession is journalism. And I tell you, getting information in Zimbabwe from these key policymakers, stakeholders, it's very, very tough. So what more now issues about money? And also given the polarization in our societies, where if you're an opposition um, member or if you're an opposition politics, you are an enemy of the state. I think Uganda, you may relate to that. Yeah, if you're opposition, you're an enemy to the state. So people who even fund or who even donate to opposition politics or political parties and who support opposition um, candidates or parties, 
they don't want to disclose. They don't want to be known, you know. They want to do it discreetly. They don't want to be known because once they are known, even when they're in business, they start facing problems and challenges in that particular business. So it's very difficult even to have, even the donate, those who are donating, even allowing you to disclose their, their, that they are, uh, they are donating money and they are funding you. So it comes with a whole lot of challenges in Africa, um, where, of course, it would be very ideal uh, to track, even for us domestic observers. So in my country, I'm, I work for the Zimbabwe Election Support Network, the biggest observer uh, group in Zimbabwe, citizen observers. We tried so many times to track political parties' financing, doing it manually, attending rallies, trying to see, okay, average, how many posters have been posted in this uh, uh, area? How many, okay, how much does the PA system cost? How much does this cost? So that we just have an idea of how much political parties were, ex um, were using in terms of money. It's difficult. It's, it's not easy. Some of the venues, if it's a, a, the ruling party, sometimes they are provided for free. Sometimes they don't pay. Sometimes they, So it's very, very difficult. But I like the idea that the in, in coming of ICTs may help, but only... Uh, in instances where our, our democracy is also improving and there's openness and there's com a fair competitive competition between parties, not for political parties that are in opposition, to be identified as enemies. Once we have still have that scenario uh, of uh, opposition parties being labeled as enemies, it's very, very difficult. Then there's another issue also that comes in with um, ICTs. We have so many, um, uh, what do you call it, models or so many um systems that are coming to assist us in in africa to improve the way we monitor to improve the way we track some of these things uh what i've also realized is that uh the, the, the sometimes it also uh, increases the expense of our elections in africa i want to come back to kenya i think this time around I, I don't have the evidence and data, but I think this time, just seeing what I'm seeing in Kenya and observing, I think this is one of the most expensive elections in, in, in Africa. The way they are using technology and the way they are also um, employing technology in, in trying to improve from what uh, were the, some of the challenges in the last election with regards to technology. So it also makes our elections very, very expensive as well uh, in terms of uh, tracking some things. And yet sometimes you don't get the information that you require. You want to do advance, try something else. I think I earlier on I spoke about possibility of having drones, you know, a drone that is moving around and you see what kind of materials, resources that are being used in a particular rally and you download the information, then you try to analyze it. That also comes in with expense. So it also makes it very expensive. So probably let's also try to see technology in the sense of, technology that is affordable, that we can utilize as, um, as uh, Africans, that does not make our elections or our electoral processes and even as observers too, too expensive so that at the end of the day, we may even fail to monitor or to, to build uh, even capacities of people to observe and uh, monitor some of these things. So I, for now, I will hand over back to you, moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I want now to bring in uh, Mr. Emmanuel Luka. Uh, Africa is home to the youngest population in the world. And young people and young have people uh, synonymous with uh, 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 ICT apps. apps. How can How Africa can harness Africa the potential Africa of young people in providing uh, digital solutions to opaque financing of political parties and elections? Yeah, um, th thank you, Abel. That's a very interesting, uh, uh, interesting question. Indeed, uh, just before I answer that, just to uh, highlight something that Ellen just mentioned. Uh, in Uganda, um, in Uganda, what is also very interesting is that um, uh, we have actually what we call the Financial Intelligence Authority that basically monitors the money that comes in from abroad to any account, especially for politically political personnel who are known maybe... in government so most of those accounts are actually highly monitored with the fia and i think government has data about how that information is coming in or even information coming in about uh, uh money is coming into accounts of political parties but indeed for 
for, for citizens in the country, probably businessmen, they may be very discreet if they are giving money to political parties and probably just hand over cash and uh, they, it will be quite impossible from a technological perspective for you to gather that kind of information because of the discretion that is definitely involved. Now back to your question that you asked, how can the young population in Africa harness the role of technology to try to address um, uh, this issue around, around, um, around the opaqueness involved in uh, political campaign financing? Yeah, indeed. Uh, I'm not sure, do you guys hear me? Uh, uh, Dr. Magnus is saying uh, there's a problem with my speakers. Is that okay? Yeah, okay, that's fine. Yes. So indeed, uh, the young people in Uganda, if you see the movement of the young people, especially on social media and uh, on all these different platforms, be it Facebook, be it TikTok, be it uh, Instagram, they share all these videos and things that are happening in different political campaigns. And indeed, it becomes a data source that we can actually harness as a source of data that we can, we can use to verify how much money has been spent. However, there has to also be a quotient much as technology itself is a good platform that we use, you also have to realize that it can also be used to actually share fake information. So you, as, as an observer, you're caught between identifying that what is shared online, is it genuine or is it not fake? So you, before you actually start to use it as your source of data, you want to be able to, to disaggregate that data to actually tell whether it actually makes sense or it's just fake data. Because if it's fake data, and then at the end of the day, you use it within your, your report, then there are credibility issues eventually that end up coming to, 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 to your platform. Indeed, technology plays that role. Globally, you remember the incident about um, the Trump campaign and uh, this company that was based in the UK that eventually had to close down. Because, I mean, technology tools like AI, artificial intelligence, can actually be used for predictive analysis. And in a way, they can also be used in, in the ways that you share the data around political campaigns to share a certain narrative of political information. But indeed, the tools are available and the young people are always very much interested in the use of these technology tools. I mean, today, the other advantage is that um, phones have become way more cheaper in Africa with Android. So for just $30, $20, they can easily afford the phones. Data is also becoming affordable for the youth. There are cheaper platforms that they can actually buy data and they can be able to share this information. It's a platform for learning. It's a platform for entertainment. So in a way, yes, it plays a critical component. But I think to empower them to do that, there has to be specific tailored training on how to empower the youth to be able to generate data that we can actually be used for, for research so that even as we share research coming in from all this information regarding a political campaign, it is data that is based on a structured format of training that we can actually use to inform policy, to inform the legal framework, to inform all the other aspects that include elections and to enhance transparency within the whole uh, spectrum of the electoral processes. So even, even as we do that, there has to be specific, let's say maybe CSO organizations that need to play that role to just be able to collect the data, but also having a discussion with political parties themselves that, hey, can you start to adopt technology in terms of sharing your databases about how you receive data on at least the information uh, as far as campaigns or donations that they receive that is genuine. Of course, in Uganda here, we have uh, this money that political parties receive from government based on the numbers in parliament. At least you can be able to look at that. But there is still a lot of money that is used within elections that you can't quantify, you can't tell its source and so forth. And of course, it raises other challenges about the sources of this money when you're trying to combat issues like um, terrorism, when you want to combat um, um, money laundering and things like that. Of course, in Uganda, we have the Anti-Money Laundering Act, we have the Anti-Terrorism Act. So all these other issues are things that we need to pay attention to even as we continue to conduct issues and pay attention to issues around uh, political campaigns using technology or other manual and traditional methods. Uh, thank you very much, Abel. Thank you. I'll go now back to Dr. Magda Putman. You have done a lot uh, in, term, in this area, and uh, I want to know whether African, African election management election bodies and also bodies governments are really ready to embrace ICT. 
as a solution to uh, the opaque uh, political finance. If African governments are ready to do this, uh, no. But that's part of a larger issue, which is governments in African countries are not willing to address the issue of money in politics and transparency in that field in general. That's not related to ICT as such. So we need to remember that what we are talking about today is an issue where politicians regulate how politicians act, right? That's how a democracy works. We can't get away from that. But we must also realize the shortcomings and the, the negative consequences of that and it means that <clears throat> to see change, we need to push from below. We need to push in terms of the demand side of saying we require uh, transparency. If people are willing to make large donations, but they don't want the parties to tell anyone where the money came from, we need to push and say there should be a system in place where the politicians say, well, unfortunately, we can't receive that money if we are not able to tell people where it came from. Because otherwise there will be a big gap in our accounting and we'll be sanctioned by whatever institution is in charge. That is not the situation in any African country today, but it's where, where we're aiming for. That's where we need to go. So there needs to be a demand from below to say, you, the governments of our country, need to make sure that we bring in transparency in how politicians, parties, and election campaigns raise and spend money. And ICT is part of that with all the shortcomings that we were talking about. I've seen, uh, I've read some reports uh, across the globe. I still want you uh, to help us on that. Uh, there are various uh, countries that are already complaining about the Bitcoin, where people are making donations using Bitcoin and you cannot trace who, who is this person. And uh, their countries already are saying we need to stop donations that are coming through Bitcoin. And we know Bitcoin is one of now the technologies people can use to send money and do what. So what can you say about that? Well, the jury is still very much out in relation to cryptocurrencies, uh, including Bitcoin and others. Uh, in relation to campaign finance. There are a lot of complaints regarding the possibilities to achieve transparency. Uh, then others are making the claim that it's actually, once you go into the system, more transparent than others. So uh, there are, there's still a lot of discussion to be had regarding the pros and cons. There is an argument, as you mentioned, to simply ban uh, donations in cryptocurrency. Uh, that's a possibility, at least outside of countries uh, including some in Latin America, where cryptocurrencies have actually been accepted as a national currency. Uh, I want to go back to Ellen. Ellen, there's a question coming out from, that has just been flashed on the screen from Henry, who, who is asking that uh, who is that candidate who came, who, who is the presidential candidate that arrived at the campaign rally with seven helicopters? I know you said you, would, you didn't want to mention it, but now one of our followers is trying to ask for... <laughs> who is the candidate. So I don't know whether you are comfortable disclosing who the candidate is before we can proceed. <laughs> no, I can't because uh, here I am with another organization um, in Kenya. I'm not with my organization that I work for, Zessin. But right now I'm speaking on behalf of Zessin, so I can't. Uh, but you can go on, Facebook, on, on on social media, YouTube, just check the front runners. You will see the videos. They are there. They are there, so I need to put that disclaimer as well. My 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 views and what I'm talking about in this meeting are not for the organization that invited me in Kenya, which is African Union, but the organization that I work for. So yeah, so that one I, I'm not able to answer. Unfortunately, my my apologies. So um, do you have another question for me? Yes, you, you initially hinted about how uh, the Kenyan parliament never accepted the Election Finance Act, which was brought to them by the IECB. Uh, mm -hmm. They decided to kick it out, and now there's nothing that is regulating how uh, politicians and 
candidates spend their money during this election. According to your own observation, as I, I as uh, one of the observers uh, for African Union, how has this affected maybe all the playing field in terms of spending? What money is coming? Where money is coming from? And is do is Kenya having any plan of maybe coming up with any ICT solution in terms of stopping how much money comes in and knowing where where is it coming from? Okay, thanks. Uh, again, I will, I will repeat, I will not be able to speak on behalf of African Union. Um, but like I indicated, it's an observation that I made personally, uh, that the law for thresholds, uh, uh, for, for giving parties a threshold in terms of what they can spend during campaigning was not um, passed by parliament. I think Magnus uh, said it very well that uh, policies are made by politicians and those politicians are the same ones that uh, contest uh, in elections. So sometimes you find that they will not make uh, policies that affect them as individuals or even as political parties. If there was going to be a threshold, it was going to disadvantage both the incumbent and also the opposition political parties. But somehow, of course, it will favor those small parties that do not have many resources. What I've also noted in some countries, um, what governments do uh, sometimes they actually they actually give deals you know they can give big deals uh, for companies like maybe the Chinese to construct roads uh, give them big deals of billions of dollars or millions and then uh, as part of the deal probably negotiated outside the contract that you need to fund us for the elections as a party or as a party in government um, and I want, I still want to come back to the issue of social media uh, as uh, I see this. I think we've managed to get some of this information uh, of such deals and such um, happenings in the social media arena where we have people even within the government, disgruntled people, leaking uh, uh, the, the, this information out to the general public. So the role of an ordinary citizen now, I think... Uh, or in, in, in the role of citizen observers, but in, in particular, even citizens that are working in government institutions in terms of releasing that information in the public domain, I think remains critical. Uh, what some may call maybe crowdsourcing, where a person has got a general public uh, has information, they provide it to the different key stakeholders who can analyze and use that information in their advocacy or use that information to influence uh, change of policy in terms of uh, whatever issues that are at play. So it's very important, I think, for for uh, stakeholders, in particular those who are engaged in this uh, arena or this uh, expertise, I think the likes of uh, Magnus there, to help citizens, to help us as civic society to build our capacity, to also encourage citizens to provide us with this information so that we can use it and analyze it to influence uh, policies. I will come back to the issue of helicopters that I alluded to. I was not at that particular rally, but I saw a video on YouTube. And I was like, oh, wow, this person is quite rich. If it's state resources, then this should be interrogated. If it's personal resources, then that is very interesting. If it's a donation. So I, I, I was left with many questions because it's, it's, it's massive money to have seven helicopters at a rally. It's not a joke. So... It helped us in terms of understanding the political arena better as uh, as observers. But like I said, I will not be able to dwell much into that because I'm here standing in for another organization, but I'm invited here <laughs> by African Union, so I cannot speak on behalf of African Union. But I just wanted to bring you to understand that let's also explore ICTs beyond what ICTs can do to analyze information, to help us get information, to help us improve transparency, but also how ICTs in terms of social media is being used to gather information that we can use as experts, as stakeholders, to analyze and influence policy, analyze and influence um, uh, laws and, uh, and regulations that improves and that gives a level playing food for all political parties. Imagine someone bringing four by four cars, Range Rovers, helicopters, yet an opposition imaging political parties. In the case of Kenya, there are four presidential candidates the two front runners, I think they, these are the ones that are being talked about mostly, uh, the two front runners, the current president and the opposition 
uh, political um, leader who is contested. Now I think this is the fifth or sixth time uh, Honorable Raila Odinga. But the other two, if you compare the resources that they are using and these two, it's definitely not uh, uh, giving a level playing field for the four players. So we want to interrogate all those things with evidence. So this evidence is being provided for by citizens through social media platforms. So let's not ignore that kind of uh, uh, the role of ICTs, how ICTs are also playing part in such instances where we have citizens giving information through social media and we are able now to see and analyze that as, uh, as political uh, analysts in, in some of this um, work that we do. And I also wanted to, to just respond uh, briefly about, um, uh, about what Magna said, um, that governments need to be more transparent I think as Africa, as African government, we, we, that's our wish. And uh, that's where we also endeavor that our governments can do in terms of increasing transparency. But also remember that these governments, they don't want to, 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 to be removed from power. So they will do whatever means to protect uh, that power. And they will do whatever they can to make sure that they, they are not removed from power. So this can be... Um, a, by making sure that they don't disclose any information that will jeopardize that, that will jeopardize whatever they can to retain power. So it's also quite very difficult even for citizen observers to really engage the government, to push the government to be transparent or to push the government to adopt some of these policies and rules and laws that we are talking about, where we are saying government should be able to to put in place laws, of course, like for is in in line with what Uganda has, uh, the financial intelligence. We also have that in my country. We also have issues of money laundering, but you find that they are only maybe uh, applied. The rules and laws are only up enforced to one side, the opposition political party, civic society, and the government is not um, compelled to really uh, 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 not receive big donations or whatever from anyone inside or outside the country. So that's uh, quite of, th that challenge is still there in Africa. If I can say it's still there, it's still very alive. And we need also to continuously see how we can engage with our government to enhance transparency, which is not easy. As long as we are pushing for something that will expose them, it will not be easy for us. Yeah, thank you. Back to you, moderator. Thank you. Uh, I want to know, I don't know whether uh, Emmanuel is still with us. I wanted to ask him as an expert in ICT, there, there are various uh, issues that were always uh, brought out by, by, by members and uh, some of the, the politicians and also voters. They, they say even if we are to use ICT uh, to ensure that there's transparency in financing of political parties, there's still there, there, there's a likelihood that some of these ICT platforms can still be manipulated and hacked and uh, you ensure you see that the figures that are entered there can easily be hacked and and changed by some who are who are not who are not wishing well for that ict platform or software which has been introduced to ensure that this transparency they can easily hack it and manipulate some of those uh, figures so i wanted him as an expert in this area of ict how can African countries and also the world ensure that they can secure some of these platforms from hackers and those people who are having intentional growth, maybe sabotaging and manipulating uh, the transparency of political financing of any country? I don't know whether I think it's off. Um, uh, they have, have been told it's off, but I think Magnus can help us. Yeah. The thing, though, is that <clears throat> systems like this can be vulnerable to, to hacking, to interference, but that only really matters if the information is in these systems in the first place. And I think that's the challenge we're facing in most African countries today. I think Emmanuel said in the beginning, he said 80%, 20% ICT and 80% other work. And I think that that's, well, we can discuss the figures, but that's a very relevant point to make. Uh, there are limitations to what ICT can do. And part of that is hacking. But beyond that, before that, I should say, it's what goes into the system itself. ICT tools cannot create transparency. If the data isn't there, there's nothing ICT 
can do to make it available to us. So uh, in an in ideal scenario, we would have citizens in Uganda, in Zimbabwe, in Ghana, in Kenya, in Lesotho, wherever you are, getting the data published by an oversight institution and say, is that right? Okay, I actually saw those seven helicopters that we are now talking about. I haven't seen them either, so I don't know. Uh, but it's not in the financial report. So I'm going to report that there's a mistake there. That's an excellent thing because we can then use the people to assist in oversight. But it doesn't work if those financial data isn't submitted in the first place. Mm. If there is no data available to us, then, then they can't do it. ICT tools can't create data. I talked in the beginning about how we can cross-check donation records with tax records, for example. That can be an incredibly useful tool in seeing is what is being submitted reasonable. But only if there are donor records and only if there are tax records and they are good enough to be uh, for us to be able to make those comparisons. The same thing with monitoring how state resources are used that's only possible if the data is there. So I think a lot of what Ellen has been saying about the challenges that we're facing in African societies is incredibly relevant. And we haven't even started talking about vote buying, which of course tends to be almost entirely outside of the official system that ICT can help us with. Thank you, Dr. Sultman. I want to go back to Emmanuel. I I wanted to ask you, but you had gone off. Uh, good, good, you're back. ICT tools are very vulnerable to things like hacking, and uh, they can easily be interfered with by either the state or other people who are not wishing good for anything coming out of ICT. So I wanted to know from you as an expert, do you think once African countries embrace the role of enhancing transparent political financing in Africa using ICT, how can they ensure that the vulnerability of being hacked and uh, interfered is minimized or reduced from your perspective as an expert? Uh, thank you very much, Abel. Indeed, any technology platform all over the world is prone to being hacked. These systems are built by people. It's people who build them, and equally, people can actually penetrate them. It doesn't mean that once you have a system built, it's not prone to, 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 to vulnerabilities. As with the growth of technology, every system must continuously update itself. That's why you've noticed that globally, from a technological perspective, there are people who are called ethical hackers. They basically pay to try to penetrate systems, and from their experience, they are able to identify vulnerabilities of each system, and then, then they can be able to build uh, improvement to ensure that they are safe. So as far as technology is concerned, every system definitely must adhere to standards about safety and they have to continuously monitor and ensure that they build mechanisms within them to ensure safety. You've had even of banks, even bank systems themselves. We've had of fraudulent scenarios in the country itself here where so many banks have lost a lot of money because of fraud. So every technology system all over the world may have vulnerabilities here and there. So it also means any system that you use that is built by people, because they're built by people, can be hacked. So it just means that you continuously have to improve your methods, you have to improve your system, you have to continue doing your checks, there has to be dedicated expertise to understand the best processes and build mechanisms for improvement and safety. So as far as that is concerned, I think it's just one of the things you have to be aware of when you're using any technology system, be it your email, be it your social media account, be it when you're accessing your bank records from a different country. I mean, all these things have to be conscious. When accounts, you've had uh, people lose a lot of money on their on their on their account on on, on their bank systems. You've had uh, election systems being hacked. Uh, you, you know, it was actually one of the key issues where the Supreme Court actually did. I think we have uh, lost uh, Emmanuel, the network is, uh, I think, disturbing him. Uh, but I wanted to come to Ms. Ellen Ligani. 
I know you are you are you are you are still in Kenya and there are there are issues that are, are coming out of that election which I, I don't know whether you'll be in position to share with us or you're still reserved as the, but you can share as an independent person not as someone who is working with African Union we have seen a lot of uh, of course money there are certain things that are happening and everyone is asking him or her questions where is all this money coming from is it from 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 the state because you find that the now Raila Odinga is uh, alongside Uhuru but also you find that uh, you 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 find the other candidates also part who was a deputy president so there is a mix of where people are still claiming most of the money is coming from the state but they don't know how is it how is it being channeled do they just use uh, other means of using other deals to get it so it's not clear on how the money is being gotten so i wanted that i wanted you to help us explain what is really happening there and how transparent is it in terms of uh, accessing this money our information about where these people are getting their money from do you access do you have any any access with information of such regard or it's very difficult for you to get such information yeah, to be to be honest with you, it's very difficult. I don't have uh, that information. I don't know. We are only making assumptions um, because uh, of uh, the paradox around the, this election, where the, like I said, the president supporting uh, the opposition and also the other front runner being in government currently as deputy president. So I, I, I would be. I, I don't want to be honest with you. I don't have that that information. Uh, in terms of how the how the two are being funded as mm. um as the two front runners but from their campaigns you can you can tell you can you can derive a lot um in terms of uh just uh, and uh, uh, judging uh that uh, there is use of uh, quite some significant resources are being used in this election in terms of these campaigns but the actual source to be honest with you i wouldn't know then I saw there was a question that was posted by, I think it was Henry, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it appeared on the on the screen. It were, okay, EMBs are the best, okay. Um, yeah, I think to some extent, yes, EMBs can, can play a role uh, in, in that, in promoting political parties, financing uh, transparency, but it depends also with um, the models that uh, each country may decide to adopt i will give an example uh for example in my country we don't have uh political parties financing regulation uh law we only have the political parties financing law but we don't have any political parties regulation uh law and like other countries like kenya uh tanzania rwanda south africa they actually regulate and register political parties so it's easier um, if a country has regulation or registration and regulation rather, it's easier for a country then to 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 compel political parties to provide and to disclose their sources of funding. Uh, also to provide uh, whoever is regulating the political parties with audited accounts, annual reports, and all those kind of requirements, and for to subject their their finances under scrutiny by the body that is um, uh, registering and regulating political parties. So in the case of Kenya, they have what they call the Office of the Registrar of Political Parties. All political parties are required to be registered under that um, at, uh, institution. Um, and then the EMB is also to plays a role uh, to some extent in terms of regulating political parties. I'll give you an example of what they have here. They've got what they call the two-thirds rule, the two-thirds gender rule, which is provided for in the constitution. But unfortunately, there's no enabling act uh, to implement that particular gender rule. The EMB tried to compel political parties in this election to, compare, uh, to adhere to that particular uh, provision in the constitution. Um, so that's also part of also regulating, compelling political parties to 
act in a way that is provided for in the law. Then we have countries like uh, my country, Zimbabwe, where we don't have regulation, where we don't have political parties registration. I can just wake up today, uh, me, my children, my, my family, we register our party. We, we don't even register. We just write a letter to the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission and notify them that uh, I've, uh, we have a party called Party ABC. Uh, we are resided, uh, residing at this, this. This is where our offices are. These are our email addresses and telephone numbers if you want to contact us, that's all you do in Zimbabwe. So it then becomes very difficult for any institution, in particular the Electoral Commission, to regulate my finances as a party or to regulate my operations as a party. It's not because it, there's no law that compels the the management body to do that. But in some, so why I was to, I want to talk about models. So in some countries they have a separate office of the registrar for political parties doing all that. Then in some countries, uh, like South Africa, it's actually done by the Independent Electoral Commission of South Africa, which regulates, which register, and so forth. So it depends with uh, what model a country uh, adopts and what model a country prefers. In my country, we are currently uh, discussing um, the issues of regulation and regulation and its advantages, I think, are more than the disadvantages. And uh, I think it will also uh, increase issues of transparency and even issues of political parties' finance are one of the things that we are saying. If there is regulation, if political parties formalize and register their parties, it's easier for a country to really um, 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 scrutinize the operations of political parties, especially around political parties financing and uh, how resources are being used. Even for those parties that are benefiting from the political parties funding now, it will also be easier to see how the monies are being used by a party and even to compare political parties to use a certain percentage purely for administrations of the political party and also to target allocation of some of the funding towards uh, in a special interest groups like women, youth, people with disabilities within political parties. And uh, I think it will also remove quite a number of uh, allegations that we normally hear of that money is being misused, abused, the money that is provided for by the government to political parties that are in parliament in the case of Zimbabwe. So EMB can do that. I think it's possible. Uh, South Africa is one of the countries that is doing that, but a, each country can choose uh, what model they want, whether a separate office of the registrar of political parties that can regulate and register, or we just have your own office of the registrar that only registers and the EMB regulates, or you can have all in one residing in the election management body. So it, it depends with what, what model a country chooses. Thank you, over. Thank you. I want to bring now Dr. Magnus. You, you, you have done, uh, I want to hear your insights on which model works best. Should it be the EMB or there should be a question of an independent political finance regulator that is in charge of ensuring that political parties report, disclose their finances, other than again having the electoral management body, which is in charge of conducting the election and all other things, again, also trying to oversee how political parties are funding, uh, I mean, uh, getting their sources and also funding their campaigns. What model is best for? any country or in according to your own opinion. so across africa it's mainly the election management body the election commission that deals with this issue is theoretically ellen highlighted the kenya we have the office of the registrar of political parties we have similar institutions in a couple of countries um also mentioned madagascar has a different system sierra leone has a separate Commission for the Registration of Political Parties, which is separate from the Election Commission, although the head of the Election Commission is a commissioner. Um, there are advantages with having election management bodies as oversight institutions. They are fully aware of the political system. Uh, they offer very good at ICT compared to other institutions, so that can be an advantage in the context that we're talking about. There are also sensitivities, though. Um, an election management body runs elections, right? And a key part of that means being seen as neutral, not being involved in politics. They are running the elections 
and then whoever wins the elections wins the elections. It's a purely technical process. And as part of that, many EMBs, not least in Africa, really stress the point of not being involved in the political process. And I, I have a lot of sympathy for that. We can't get away from the fact that dealing with political finance is inherently political. So once you, once you deal with this issue, you can't get away from the fact that there will be some certain sensitivities. If you sanction a political party, give them a fine or they're not allowed to run in elections or they lose public funding, etc., those sanctions have political consequences. So I can see that there are also disadvantages and many election management bodies in African countries don't really want to have this mandate. It may be worth stressing, no institution wants to have this mandate. It's not particularly popular with anyone, which I can understand. Um, there is a lot of debate on the best model for this. There is no consensus. I think we should stress that. <clears throat> I think a key part of what Ellen said of an advantage with EMBs is, well, they are there and they, they can do the job. What I think we should warn against is, creating a new commission or a new entity that will deal with this specifically. That's not necessarily solving any problems. Uh, a key point is that regardless of what model, regardless of what institution that is in charge, more important is that it has certain uh, factors. It needs to have the independence to run uh, effective oversight of party and campaign finance. In theory, <clears throat> election management bodies across Africa have this. In practice, it, it may be worse. Um, so this is different in like North Africa, for example, when a number of countries is the minister is a ministry, often the Minister of the Interior, that runs elections. That's problematic because they don't necessarily have that independence. The body must have the mandate and the powers to act in relation to these issues so that they can actually take on uh, powerful political actors. Uh, they must have the resources to do this. Uh, the Independent National Electoral Commission in Nigeria has worked on bringing transparency uh, in Nigerian elections. There are a lot of people in Nigeria that don't necessarily have the resources that are needed. And the final, but I'd say the most important is regardless of the model, the institution put in charge must have the political will so that they can take on the government, the government party, main opposition parties, big, big politicians and say, you know what, you're not actually following the rules, so we're going to initiate sanctions against you. Thank you. There was a question, uh, Elizabeth, uh, I saw Lisa Karunja had asked, I think it was going to Dr. Magnus, how are European electoral jurisdictions using information and communication technology to enhance transparency? And I would like, uh, once you, while you're responding to that, also you connect to whether, how, what can Africa borrow from? How maybe the European jurisdictions are using ICT to enhance transparency in political financing? Uh, <clears throat> so it does vary quite a lot. Uh, across Europe and I would say that leading this process right now is Eastern and, and Southeastern Europe. Uh, the former communist countries come out of dictatorships. They are very good at especially the publication side to make data available to citizens. There are other ways, still ways to go but they are, they are really good at that. We have in a number of European countries electronic reporting uh, <clears throat> so that parties submit their reports directly uh, electronically. There's no paper format. And there are in some countries like Finland, for example, parties submit their financial reports. And when they do that, they become available to the public automatically. So the, the oversight institution, which happens to be an audit body here, they don't actually do anything. They just sit there, they provide the platform, the parties upload the data and it becomes available to the public. What's mainly, <clears throat> excuse me, what's mainly lacking in many European countries is the tools for using this data to control its accuracy. 
And that's not really that the ICT isn't there. It's not that it's not being used to cross-check these financial records with other data that's available, tax records, custom records, you know, a whole host of things. There's a lot that Africa can learn from the European experience, uh, good things, and also a lot of bad things that European countries have done uh, over the years, things that they have, mistakes that they have learned from. It, but it then boils down to, we need to have this data available to us. If, as Ellen was talking about, uh, we don't have this information about donations submitted to us, then there's nothing we can do with ICT to make it available. So that's the that needs to be the starting point. Thank you, Dr. Mogamas. Thank you. One of the major challenges related to money in politics is the lack of transparency surrounding political party and election finance. Open and transparent funding of political parties and candidates is desirable because it helps to ensure everyone is playing by the rules. This in turn strengthens the integrity of and trust in politics of the general public and political parties in Africa. Transparency helps to level the playing field, exposes the risk of undue influence over politicians and helps protect against the infiltration of illicit sources of money thus contributing to the broader fight against corruption. In recent years, there has been considerable progress in the use of information technology to enhance transparency in financing political parties and election campaigns. The rapid digitalization of government agencies, political parties and citizens alike has significantly expanded the potential to use digital tools to enhance transparency. Use of technology, including digital tools such as websites, programs, and online resources can help provide solutions towards addressing undeclared, undisclosed, and or dirty money in politics. When a country builds an online reporting and disclosure system, it becomes part of a wider societal effort to protect and enhance the integrity of politics. In this eighth webinar series on money in politics in Africa, we interrogate the role of ICT in political finance reporting and disclosure.